dairy products time and time again, caffeine and alcohol, sugar, junk food, other foods. Candida, the organism and the fungus problem, unquestionably so. Um, I asked the question yesterday, if those are not here, how many people in the audience have never ever had an antibiotic? Anybody going to put their hand up to them? I'm the, only person, I'm the only person here who's never in their lifetime had an antibiotic. Neither is my wife. So the fungal type dysbiosis is one way of calling it. And the history of antibiotics is a very, very common problem. And then mercury. So many people have mercury fillings in their teeth, especially in their top teeth, and it's a very short distance between there and the, cent and the central nervous system. And it's not surprising if problems occur. And then infections, chickenpox, shingles. A lot of people who have the sensory symptoms have an infection in their system. I used to treat the chickenpox shingles virus homeopathically with great success. And there can be chlamydia, acinetobacter, spirochetes. Various different organisms can cause various different symptoms, very similar to multiple sclerosis. And then there's the nutritional needs, vitamin B12. I used to give massive doses of vitamin B12, and I'll come on to it in a minute. Magnesium, B vitamins, glutathione, omega 3 oils, vitamin D. There was a Canadian researcher who believes that vitamin D will one day be, sorry, that multiple sclerosis will one day be redefined as a vitamin D deficiency disease. Maybe he's right, I don't know. And then the toxic substances, the pesticides, the mercury, the lead, the radiation, the tobacco. Very important, that one, tobacco and aspartame. There's an epidemic of young kids developing multiple sclerosis-like symptoms because they're addicted to Diet Coke in America. It's absolutely extraordinary, but that's a fact. And then don't forget that tobacco is related um, in the deadly nightshade family to potatoes, tomatoes, aubergines, and peppers. And the fifth one is tobacco. So if you find a person who's sensitive to tobacco, take them off the others, and you'll be surprised how much benefit they can benefit from. This is a fascinating subject. Temporomandibular joint dysfunction, the jaw joint. If I was very fortunate to see a person with a functional problem with a left-sided arm and leg or a right-sided arm and leg, I could magically improve them, magically improve them. I would get them to walk up and down uh, my corridor and show what they could do with their stick if necessary. I would then look in their teeth, and every single time I would see A, a, a big overlap, and B, there was a slight um, deviation to one side. I then put a wooden spatula in the back of their teeth, lining their teeth up absolutely perfectly. And they'd walk up and down, and they would drop their stick. They would literally drop their stick. It was that impressive. And I would say to them, what does this mean to you? If you can now suddenly walk better, what does it mean? And they'd say, what does it mean? The answer is, it means you do not have permanent, irreversible damage. You can't possibly get a person to... Then I would take the, the spatula out, and they would have to use their stick again. So I could instantly do it. So I can assure you, once I'd ever demonstrated that to a person, they, they would listen to absolutely everything I said from then onwards. That, of course, means that they have a problem in their spinal the top, the, the spinal fluid, uh, the, sorry, the spinal joints, and that needed um, an osteopath or chiropractor to deal with it. Raised homocysteine. Um, most people don't know what homocysteine is. Homocysteine is a chemical imbalance, which is far more of a, um, an arterial poison than cholesterol has ever been. And homocysteine is what roughens up the surface of the, of the arteries and then cholesterol comes in and tries to smooth it over. Yes, if you've got a lot of that going on, yes, you will end up by clogging your arteries um, and causing the heart attacks and the strokes. But it's probably caused by a raised level of homocysteine. And again, once again, the blood levels are not correct. The levels in my own local laboratory are between 10 and 16 um, units. It should be below six. So the, what they call the normal levels are not normal. They're the reference levels. They're the levels that are found in the majority of people. Now, I found the functional type. That means the ones with the stiff legs and, and, legs and, and arms that would not work properly responded much more to the big dietary problems, big dietary approaches. Um, and 
Um, but the modification, of the, sorry, I beg your pardon, the functional type responds more to the dietary modification than the sensory type. And these, they also needed much more magnesium and glutathione. I had a young lady who came from Israel to see me and she took ages to get from my, my uh, waiting room into my room. And it's really not much further than across here. Probably a couple of minutes she took her to walk. I told her she must go home and change her diet and do various different things. I gave her an intravenous infusion of vitamins and minerals. And she rang me three days later saying she'd walked straight across the, um, the, the, air, the, 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 the place where they... Where did, what is the place that you call when you get out of a plane? <laughs> anyway, she walked straight across the, uh, the place from then on without using her stick. It was that magic. It had a most amazing and beneficial effect upon it. And I think people with multiple sclerosis are grossly deficient in most, most vitamins and minerals. The sensory type responds to large doses of vitamin B12. The average daily requirement for human beings is probably only about one microgram. You take about 10 micrograms into your daily diet, but you only need one microgram. But I used to give up to 30 thousand micrograms intravenously on a weekly basis. So the blood levels, as far as I'm concerned, are a waste of time. I had at least half a dozen patients who came in like a cat on a hot tin roof. They would actually walk really gingerly because they were in pain from their sensory symptoms. And I would give them a vitamin B12 in infusion of maybe eight or 12,000 um, micrograms. And within half an hour, half an hour of starting the infusion, taking about an hour to an hour and a half, their symptoms would disappear. It's absolutely magic, disappear. But occasionally some of those patients um, would, would come back um, again for, for another infusion. And I would take a sample of blood from their one vein before I gave them infusion, and their level of blood was five times the upper limit of normal. So instead of roughly about 1,000 units, they were 5,000. But they were symptomatic. I would give them the intravenous infusion of 8 or 12 um, um, micrograms. I would then take a sample of blood from another vein, and there were 25,000. But they were now symptom-free. So what is correct? I would suggest that the, the blood level of vitamin B12 is meaningless, and it's a sensory nervous system or a tissue level. And both types certainly benefit from mercury amalgam replacement and chelation. But please, the mercury amalgam replacements must be done by a dentist who knows how to do it. It's very, very important indeed. And the chelation is also extremely important. Stress plays a huge part in everything that people do. We talk, it's been talked about already this morning. I talked about it and other people talked about it yesterday. You've got to sort out the stress. I used to see so many people. I saw a man from Greece um, whose his MS had, had done incredibly well and he was 50% better. And then he came in um, and he, he just couldn't get any further. I said, what's the problem? And his wife said, well, it's stress. I said, what was the problem with the stress? Well, he'd married his, his, his lovely wife and when he was a young man, his father kept pushing him, pushing him, pushing him to do well. Well, he'd done extremely well anyway. When he married his wife, his father-in-law pushed him, pushed him, pushed him. And he discovered the thing that most annoyed him was that they would turn up on Sunday afternoon when he just wanted to rest and relax. They would turn up for afternoon tea and bug him about doing better and better and better. And I said, why do you let this affect you? He said, well, I can't stop it because they bugged me. So I said, next weekend, invite them to come and join you. Invite them. Show you are pleased to see them. Strange enough, they didn't bother to turn up. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, if you can identify a simple approach to stress, it's amazing the effect it has upon you. And he started to get better. And I can give you many examples of that sort of thing. So I would ask people, is the stress affecting you adversely? The answer was usually yes. Are you attempting to resolve the stress? Well, possibly half-heartedly. And if yes, is it working? And the chances are it wasn't working. They weren't doing the right sort of thing. So what can the person with multiple sclerosis do for themselves? 
What ideas can a person with MS take away um, with them today to actually start their own healing process? Because I can assure you that multiple sclerosis is just like anything, like cancer, like arthritis, like asthma. And it's just something which you can do something for yourself. And I've seen it so many times. First thing to do is to believe in yourself. Believe in there is always an explanation for your problems. Most people go to the doctor and say, Doctor, I've got a problem. Will you please solve it for me? What you should say is, Doctor, what can I do to help myself? Most people don't do that. They put their hands in the doctor and they leave him to trust them, to, to treat them with a drug of some sort. Second, assume that there are causes for your condition. You'll never ever cure anything if you don't understand why it developed in the first instance. You've got to find out the cause. And I acknowledge that I have let some MS patients down. I've not been able to identify the cause of their problems. So the reason is, there is a reason, but I wasn't able to find it. And third, decide on a plan of action that you are willing to try and give it at least four months. Multiple sclerosis is a slowly developing condition, therefore you've got to give it a chance to, 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 to work. So you've got to have a plan, decide to try it, and, tr and keep going on it. The basic things that people will need to do, as I've already said, are give up all dairy products, caffeine, alcohol, junk food, sugar, white flour products, or chemical additives, or all the things like the aspartame. And there are other foods sometimes some MS patients need to consider. Red meat from the saturated fats, um, the gluten-containing grains. I didn't find gluten-containing grains to be very common as a necessity. But some people found that they needed to give up the gluten-containing grains. That's wheat, rye, oats and barley. And I always recommend that patients with MS consume more fruits, vegetables, berries. And as I said yesterday, take Juice Plus. Juice Plus, for those who want to know about it, and please have a word with me afterwards if you're interested in it, it is 26 fruits, vegetables, berries and grapes in an encapsulated form with all the water, the sugar, the salt and the fibre removed in the processing. It is an absolutely wonderful preparation and it is based upon food, good quality ripe food. And drink lots of water, it really is important. So try to do some form of exercise every day. Exercise is becoming increasingly recognised as important for just about so many things, for depression, for cancer, and certainly for multiple sclerosis. You've got to keep your body going. You've got to remind your body what it needs to do to keep itself going. If you are fortunate enough to find somebody who's prepared to give you intravenous infusions, ask them to have a, a B vitamin mix, vitamin B12 up to 30,000 micrograms, vitamin C 5 grams, magnesium sulfate working up to 5 grams, zinc, molybdenum, chromium and selenium. I gave those to thousands of patients. I don't know how many infusions I gave patients over the years and they really are incredibly effective, really amazingly effective. And if you can actually have a patient with the sensory symptoms and you can give them an infusion and in half an hour the symptoms going has gone, you know you've done a lot of good. Take some form of magnesium on a daily basis if necessary. Um, I think magnesium absorption by mouth is under the influence of an enzyme which itself is magnesium dependent. So you need to get the magnesium into your body first before you can absorb it by mouth. So maybe the best and most effective form is a transdermal magnesium and there are plenty of preparations out there that you can obtain. And of course another way is soak in a bath with Epsom salts. That's a very good way of getting it into your system and it's a very pleasant one. Take some form of B vitamins. There are various different preparations for vitamin B12. Unfortunately vitamin B12 is only absorbed from the terminal ileum just before your appendix and it's very difficult to absorb it. So sublingual sprays and various different preparations are available but not nearly as good as uh, the injection. And in fact, the intramuscular injection is not nearly as good as the intravenous injection. Um, one or two of those patients who came to see me um, um, with the, like a cat on a hot tin roof, they actually, dis they actually uh, came to see me when I'd gone away for a fortnight or something of that sort. 
and or, or they rang up to try to and their GP strange enough was willing to give them 8,000 or 12,000 micrograms intramuscularly which was very heroic and instead of their, ben their benefiting within half an hour of the infusion it took two to three days so the intravenous approach gets your blood level immediately very high your intramuscular level gets it not quite so high and it takes longer for the beneficial effect to occur and if you are going to have your mercury amalgam fillings uh, replaced it's very important to take decent doses of selenium and zinc in particular and those are the substances all of this is as I say is on my website selenium possibly vitamin C and zinc those are the three that I found from experience I tried various different variations but those are the ones that I went back to every single time selenium and zinc with occasional vitamin C and I do know that this works I saw over 9,000 patients with multiple sclerosis each one coming because I got another MS patient better no doctor can ever claim that sort of beneficial effect if a person says go to him because he's helped me that you know that you, he's worked and the 9,000 is a lot of patients so once again just to remind you if you want to get this, all this information it's on the newmedicine.info that is the main book itself that is the book where I start off with cancer go on to multiple sclerosis then go on to diabetes which I'm going to talk about next and then another 20 odd different subjects uh, of which you can work out what you need to do for yourself if you have those conditions and there are lots of very interesting stories in the whole lot now I'm going to change the subject slightly this is a more complicated one so I'm going to go through it as best I can do and then I will summarize it so don't be worried if you don't pick up what I'm trying to say beginning because it actually is a much more complicated condition basically I'm talking about obesity diabetes and syndrome X that's the metabolic syndrome and that means you have a raised cholesterol raised blood pressure raised triglycerides increased platelet stickiness and increased fat accumulation especially around your midriff now obesity well everybody's talking about obesity at present and it really is an epidemic and there's so many things people can do to, to minimize the effect the excess fat all over the body the excess fat around the midriff and the corpulent tummy there may be a genetic predisposition well most people can do whatever they like I discovered that I have a genetic predisposition to uh, migraine my mother my eldest brother and my youngest my eldest son also suffer from migraine but I discovered that my genetic predisposition was chocolate I've not had chocolate for as long as I can remember people say how can you live without chocolate well I have done because I don't wish to have a migraine but any time I wish to demonstrate I have that genetic predisposition all I need to do is eat a bar of chocolate so if you can identify the causes of your genetic predisposition you can get rid of the symptoms yes you may con uh, consume too many calories um, you may have poor food selection you may have hypothyroidism these are all need to be identified as to whether you have the problem and you may have food intolerances and I'll come on to that very importantly later on the extra fat around your midriff suggests the, ex the syndrome and one of the pictures uh, that um, was put on recently was a man with a big corpulent tummy and a corpulent tummy in a man suggests a heavy beer drinker an awful lot of people do drink large, large amounts of beer and they've got a big sack they've got to fill the wretched thing so they eat a lot of food with it so not surprisingly they put on too much weight and that also suggests low testosterone levels and the increased levels of estrogen mean man boobs in Barbados you see these blokes in their big their swimming cums they need a bra more than their wives do it's ridiculous but that's what they do it's not a bad idea to ask patients if they have any ideas why they are overweight you'd be surprised how many people actually know but don't do anything about it people talk about well it's me glands me glands well I'm not sure what that means maybe it's a thyroid gland but I don't think they mean that but a lot of people talk about glands without realizing what they're talking about ask the patient if what they have already done and tried 
Who have they consulted already? And I will give an example, if I, uh, for those of you that weren't here yesterday, of one particular patient out of two um, that, that is particularly relevant in that sort of thing as to what people have tried. And then go into their eating habits. Just do the obvious thing. I was sitting um, next to somebody who, who wanted to uh, ask my advice about how he could lose weight. And we were talking about things in general speaking. And then at the end of the meal, I said, do you realise you have eaten in this meal twice as much as I've eaten? Twice as much. I said, look at the pudding you've eaten. It's nothing but sugar. Oh, didn't think, didn't realise that. So people don't actually realise what they're eating. So even start off just by talking about that. And then the lack of the exposure to the sun. There's a lot of evidence now that diabetics have a vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D is becoming really very important. It's, it's a hormone rather than a vitamin, but it's still called a vitamin D. So vitamin D deficiency is very important. The, the recommended daily allowance of vitamin D in this country is 400 international units. I would put a new patient on 10,000 international units. Much bigger dose. Now, a lot of diabetes is caused by this thing called insulin resistance, which simply means that insulin is not doing its job properly at the amount that is being produced. The first myth I want to get rid of is that diabetes affects overweight older people. That's what doctors tell you. And it used to be called late onset diabetes. Myth two, the villain of the piece is obesity. That's the cause of the problem. I.e. diabetes is actually caused by being overweight. Yet 20% of diabetics are not overweight. So it can't be the cause. Yes, it may be a cause in many people, but it's not the cause. Myth number three. Obesity is caused by eating too much and not exercising enough. Well, isn't food supposed to give you energy? If that were true, why are diabetics always hungry and lacking in energy? That's the tat that was discussed, discussed above. Why do they eat so much? Something is not working. Yes, I know they may have a big sack, tummy, a stomach to, to fill, but that's another problem. Hunger is a mechanism by which muscle cells tell the brain that they need more fuel. You need more fuel, therefore, that's what the hunger is there for. So take the carbohydrate preparations and you'll feel better. So why doesn't eating more actually provide that fuel? Something has gone wrong with the whole system. Presumably, something stops the food you're eating doing its job. Perhaps something stops glucose actually entering the muscle cells. This is beginning to get down to the nub of what's gone wrong. If that is correct, then exercise is impossible and pointless. And I've seen television programs where you've seen these grossly overweight people being put through appalling exercise um, approaches. And it's very, very harmful, very harmful indeed. The recommendation to eat less and exercise more usually it doesn't work. They've tried it. It just doesn't work. If something doesn't work, surely the whole idea <coughs> needs to be rethought. You need to say, hang on a second, what I've suggested to you isn't working. Maybe there's another explanation for the problem. Myth number four. In syndrome X, the villain of the piece is a raised level of cholesterol. Well, I think you've already heard today and yesterday that we don't believe the cholesterol is the villain of the piece. <coughs> and yet when people die of a heart attack, cholesterol is often found blocking important arteries in the heart. But to be fair, an awful lot of people who have heart attacks are found not to have cholesterol blocking their heart. But when that is the case, therefore cholesterol is the cause they say. So low cholesterol diets and cholesterol lowering statin drugs are the answer. Well, that's also not true. However, cholesterol is actually trying to heal damage in arteries caused by the inflammation. 
It's actually trying to heal it. If the cause of the inflammation is not identified and removed, cholesterol will, to be perfectly fair, continue to try to heal the damage so there will be inevitably a build-up of cholesterol deposits. That's logical. That makes perfectly good sense. And I can understand the reasons why they try to lower the level of cholesterol, because if there's less cholesterol around, there's less to deposit. The trouble is you need the cholesterol. Myth number five. The real villain of all this is insulin resistance. If insulin is not being effective at a normal dose, your body has to produce more insulin to have the same effect. So the question is, what is stopping insulin from doing its job properly? Because presumably it's not doing it properly. And if you have the answer to that question, you have the answer to what causes diabetes in many people, diabetes and syndrome X, because they really are very much involved with each other. Now the normal physiological situation is that carbohydrate is converted into glucose. Blood sugar goes up, Insulin is produced to deliver glucose to muscle cells to make energy. That's the whole normal process. That's what your body does all the time. And if the muscle cells are full, any extra glucose is diverted to fat cells. Fat can be converted into fatty acids and used as a spare fuel if the muscle cells have all been used up and there's no extra opportunity to have more food. So you have the fatty acids which you can use as a spare fuel. Insulin resistance is said to make it difficult for glucose to enter the muscle cells. So more insulin has to be generated to overcome this, this resistance. In the meantime, because glucose cannot somehow enter the cells, the muscle cells, it is diverted into the fat cells, which then have to expand and increase in number to accommodate this extra fat particularly around the midriff. That's an easy place to put it, so your body does so. <clears throat> Interesting enough, if glucose were not diverted into fat cells, the level of sugar would rise dramatically in the bloodstream, leading to coma and death. So you could say this diversion is described as a brain protection mechanism. Very important. People can die from high blood sugar. Not as easily as low blood sugar, but they can die from it if it becomes too high. <clears throat> if glucose is diverted into fat cells, it should only occur because the muscle cells are full. Very simple, very simple to see. If glucose is diverted into fat cells, it should only occur because the muscle cells are full. But if there is insulin resistance, the muscle cells are not full because insulin is not doing its job. Insulin is not making the, f the sugar go into the cells. So in these circumstances, the entry of glucose into fat cells erroneously signals to the brain that the muscle cells are full. This in turn stops the fat cells from converting fat into fatty acids, which is the muscle cells' normal use as an alternative fuel. Things are going wrong. In a, in a vicious way. Reasoning that if the muscle cells are full, there is no need to preserve, to, to produce the reserve fuel. That makes sense. But then muscle cells are not full. So, however, as the muscle cells have not received their supply of glucose, you remain hungry. So you therefore have something sugary which gives you a natural boost but the effect doesn't last, it only makes things worse. After many years of trying to meet this extra demand for more insulin, your pancreas becomes exhausted, you fail to produce enough insulin, your blood sugar levels rise, and you show signs of having become a diabetic. And exactly when somebody becomes a type 2, be di type two diabetic is arbitrary. There may be a few people in this audience who are already diabetic and don't even know it. I don't, have no idea. What is important is to try to stop it happening and by recognising all the signs. Quite simply, if you are putting on weight, especially around your midriff, and are always hungry and feeling constantly tired, beware. 
Those are the signs that things are going wrong and you've got to start doing something about it. The combination of calorie control diet and exercise does work in some people but fails all too often. The theory is quite simple that if more food is consumed than is expended the extra will be stored as fat and you will put on weight. Conversely, if less food is consumed than is extended, expended, you will raid your fat stores and you make up the deficit and lose weight. And that does work for many people. Myth number six. Since obesity is the result of too much fat in the body, a low-fat or fat-free diet is the answer. But as already been said this morning, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So rethink theory. And the very person who brought me into um, this area of medicine years and years ago was Dr. Richard Mackinnis, a consultant psychiatrist. And he wrote his first book in 1957 entitled Eat Fat and Grow Slim. Eat Fat and Grow Slim. And he was absolutely right. And then you hear of the Atkins diet. But people don't do the Atkins diet properly. That's why it got into bad disrepute. What people forget is that carbohydrate slows your metabolism down while fat speeds it up. That's a very important and simple fact. I'll repeat that. Carbohydrate slows your metabolism down while fat speeds it up. Unfortunately for the diabetic and the pre-diabetic, high levels of insulin in the blood lock up your fat cells making it impossible for them to release the fat as fatty acid alternative fuel to glucose. Things are going wrong in your body. Your ability to release fats is further compromised by low levels of LPL called lipoprotein lipase. Now the job of lipoprotein lipase is to deliver fat to fat cells, to deliver free fatty acids from fat cells to muscle cells, and to convert triglycerides to free fatty acids. That's its job when your body has run out of the, the sugar for the muscle cells. But if you attempt to lose weight with high levels of circulating insulin, 90% of the weight you lose will actually be protein, muscle tissue. If you then put weight back on again, it will be mostly as fat, and that is not what you want. So let's look at all this in a bit more detail. Every cell of your body has literally thousands of receptors on its surface. They function like a lock and key. Every single enzyme in your body works that particular way. When insulin arrives at the receptor on the surface of a muscle cell, it signals to GLUT4, glucose transporter 4, to come to the surface to receive, thank you very much, the muscle the, glu the, the molecule of glucose. That is what normally happens. The insulin arrives at the receptor and triggers the production of, of glucose 4 to come to the surface to say thank you very much for that muscle, for that gl um, glucose molecule. At the same time, chromium moves from the bloodstream into the cell to improve the efficiency of this whole process. Chromium is very important for diabetics. Now, inflammation is part of your immune system. It's a very important, essential function for your body to fight off germ or deal with a splinter. In the process, many very chemi powerful chemicals are produced. But inflammation, you've already heard a lot about. This is an important statement. Once the invader has been dealt with, the whole process is switched off. You have an infection, your Inflammation deals with the invader and the whole system is then switched off. That is very important and I will come back to that in a minute. One very powerful chemical produced by inflammation is called TNF-alpha. Inflammation also produces many other uh, powerful chemicals, but TNF-alpha um, is, is probably the most powerful. <clears throat> Unfortunately, TNF-alpha destroys GLUT4, so it can't come to the surface of your muscle cell to accept the glucose molecule. So glucose cannot be taken into muscle cells. Glucose is therefore diverted into the fat cells. 
And unfortunately, TNF-alpha also stimulates the production of fat cells. Getting a bit nasty. And fat cells produce TNF-alpha. Oh dear, oh dear. TNF-alpha also destroys LPL, lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase can also be destroyed, can be destroyed by calorie restriction and by exercise. That's why it's not good for overweight diabetics to try to do more than a little uh, exercise. And without LPL, lipoprotein lipase, fat cannot be used as an alternative fuel to glucose. So, there's no glucose getting into your muscle cells. Your muscle cells can't even use its usual alternative fuel of fatty acids. Yet you have plenty of stores of fat which you can't use. And chromium is lost by heavy exercise, a diet high in sugar and refined carbohydrates, a diet low in antioxidants, especially vitamin C. And I'm not going to talk about vitamin C because that's a separate subject. Now, Syndrome X, which I mentioned right from the start, metabolic syndrome, according to one American doctor, probably more than 75% of Americans are prone to it, and probably much the same in this country. The initial common symptoms of an are an increase in weight, an inability to concentrate, unexplained drowsiness much of the time, decreased endurance during any form of exercise, and generally decreased levels of exercise. How many people suffer from TAT, T-A-T-T, tired all the time? So many people do, and these are the beginnings of the problem. And syndrome X, the metabolic syndrome, is associated with all forms of cardiovascular diseases, heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes. They're all interrelated. There's also an increased risk of cancer, especially the breast and colon cancer, Alzheimer's disease, polycystic ovaries, gout, inflammatory bowel disease, and blood clotting conditions, amongst others. So just about the whole area of medical problems is associated with diabetes, um, syndrome X, and overweight. And remember I said right at the beginning the syndrome X involves raised cholesterol, raised blood pressure, raised triglycerides, increased platelet stickiness, and fat accumulation around your midriff. Clearly, there is some sort of relationship between obesity, diabetes, and syndrome X. So let me just try to summarize a rather complicated set of, of facts. 80% of diabetics are overweight, not 100%. Therefore, obesity cannot be the cause of type 2 diabetes. Overweight diabetics tend to be permanently tired and don't have the energy to exercise. Low-calorie diets and exercise don't tend to work in the overweight diabetic. Type 2 diabetes can no longer be called late-onset diabetics as it's now affecting children. There are kids in their teens having legs amputated for diabetic gangrene, for goodness sake. That is absolutely horrendous. Insulin resistance and being overweight are considered to be the causes of diabetes. Insulin resistance develops because at normal levels, insulin does not achieve its purpose, namely delivering glucose to muscle cells. When insulin arrives at the insulin receptor on the surface of the muscle cell, its arrival signals normally to GLUT4 to move to the surface to receive the glucose. But unfortunately, GLUT4 is destroyed by TNF-alpha. That's tumor necrosis factor alpha. And TNF-alpha is produced as an essential part of inflammation. It's also produced by fat cells. Insulin's efficiency helper, chromium, is reduced by endurance exercise, a high sugar diet, and a diet low in antioxidants, especially vitamin C. And so many people have these problems. And who loves you? The drug companies. As a statin for your cholesterol, something for your raised blood pressure, something for blood sugar, an anti-inflammatory, maybe an aspirin, an appetite suppressant, an antibiotic, all these drugs, because you've got the condition. And who's waiting in the wings? 
the surgeon to remove your cataracts or amputate your limbs. It's all a vicious circle. But has anybody prescribed chromium or vitamin C to the diabetic? What? Chromium or vitamin C? Good Lord, no. Has anyone told you what the cause of all of this is? Maybe it's an infection, a virus, a toxic chemical, lead or mercury or stress. Yes, and possibly vitamin D. But inflammation is the cause. Inflammation, once again, is the cause of cancer, the cause of arthritis, asthma, everything. And we, of course, have mentioned the vitamin D deficiency. And yet the most likely explanation for that inflammation is food, something you consume, your own idiosyncratic um, reaction. It's very important for cancer patients and diabetics to identify their own idiosyncratic reactions. Remember the old fashioned saying, one man's meat is another man's poison? What is meat to one man is poison to another? It doesn't matter how you interpret these words. That is so important. It's been said for thousands of years, and yet we still don't take any notice of it. There's a wonderful book called Victory Over Diabetes by Dr. William Philpott and Dwight K. Kalita. They admitted patients into their clinic and fasted them on pure water only for five days. And I've done that to many patients. They then challenged each patient with single foods, taking a sample of blood before and about one hour afterwards to measure blood sugar levels. And what they found was that certain foods made their blood sugar level go up very high, while others had very little effect indeed. And you hear about high and low glycemic foods. All diabetics are taught high and low glycemic foods. But what they're not taught is that certain foods which are, to most people, low glycemic, are to them high glycemic. And that's the importance that you've got to identify. The real surprise was that many supposedly safe or low glycemic foods caused blood sugar levels to rise very high, while some high glycemic foods did not. And I had a secretary many years ago whose her husband became a late diabetic, and I put him through this whole approach. And he discovered that wholemeal bread put his blood sugar up much higher than sugar itself or white refined carbohydrate. Amazing. You think, how can that be? And yet that's what people need to identify for themselves. So you have to find out your own reactions. If any food causes your blood sugar level to rise high, and you have been eating it on a regular basis for years, it will have worn out your pancreas. That's what happens. It makes your pancreas produce the insulin too often. You can be sure that if a food that has had that effect upon your blood sugar level, it will also cause an inflammatory effect somewhere in your body. And the most likely place is your white blood cells, called the neutrophils. There is a massive information in the scientific and medical literature that shows that the extent to which the neutrophils are involved in inflammation. Food is basically non-self, it's poisonous to you until it has been broken down into, in the digestive tract into smaller molecules that the body can use to build new tissues. It can then be regarded as self or safe. If a certain food somehow escapes being broken down into smaller parts that your body can use and it manages to get into your bloodstream, it is now a foreign object that must be attacked and destroyed by your immune system. What's circulating in your blood looking for foreign invaders? For your, your white blood cells, especially the neutrophils. When a neutrophil identifies something in your blood that should not be there, they become activated. They have special methods for recognizing the invader, the, the, um, the infection, uh, the splinter you have in your body. They have methods of identifying it. And once the neutrophils have been activated, what do they produce? TNF-alpha and all the other inflammatory chemicals. But remember I said earlier that inflammation is an essential part of your body's mechanism. Without it, you would die very quickly. You cannot survive without it. And when they produce a, a TNF-alpha drug to, to block it, people surprisingly die. 
so it was withdrew, withdrawn. The chemicals produced by inflammation are very potent indeed. Their production is supposed to be in the on position for only as long as it takes to deal with the invader. Their production should be switched off when they're no longer needed. So I make this, this statement once again. Once the invader has been dealt with, the whole process is switched off. I told you to remember this statement right at the beginning. But what happens if the invader is not overcome because it is constantly invading you? Your immune system's inflammatory response will not be turned off and you will continue to produce TNF-alpha. You will produce more fat cells, which will produce more TNF-alpha. You will destroy GLUT4. Glucose won't be able to enter your muscle cells. Insulin will become even more effective and chromium won't be able to do its job to help insulin. You will destroy LPL. You won't be able to use fatty acids as an alternative fuel. You will inflame your blood vessels more. You will deposit more cholesterol. Your health will deteriorate. So that is why you are overweight or have diabetes or syndrome X. You don't understand basically what's gone wrong, but it has. You are simply consuming possibly every day, one or more foods that are causing inflammation, inflammatory reactions in you. It is as simple as that. To start to reverse all the damage, you must identify those foods. It may be essential for you to avoid the naughty foods such as sugar and chocolate. It, it may, may be even more important for you to avoid something else, something possibly considered to be a healthy food. And I will just quickly tell this story. I think those of you who heard it yesterday, no harm in repeating it. A 19 and a half stone lady, 273 pounds, diabetic, depressed, arthritic, continuous headaches, constantly tired, always hungry, no strength. Low calorie diet plus exercise for months did not help at all. She even tried a 500 calorie diet and put on weight. So she decided to go on a five day fast, water only, water only. At the end of the five-day fast, she lost 21 pounds. 21 pounds in five days, for goodness sake. All her symptoms disappeared, and according to her blood tests, she was no longer a diabetic. When she ate carrots as a challenge, all her symptoms came back, and her blood sugar levels shot up. She put on 10 pounds overnight and couldn't stop drinking water. When she ate cabbage as a challenge, sorry, she put on seven pounds, that was not ten pounds, seven pounds overnight, and some of her symptoms came back. Her blood sugar level also shot up, and she became thirsty again. And what did she eat more of on a 500 calorie diet? Vegetables. So explaining her, her cause of her problems, which she never even thought of. So how can you identify the foods that you need to avoid to let the inflammatory cascade unwind, because that's what you've got to do. As a blood test, the ALCAT blood test is a possibility. It's not a cheap test, it costs maybe two, three hundred pounds, I don't know how, how much it costs nowadays. But it certainly identifies the release of TNF-alpha. So if you have the money and you want to do it, that could be one way. But it's not 100% effective, and there are plenty of reasons for that. The simple alternative, the slower method, is you make a list of all the foods and drinks you consume regularly on a daily basis, on the two or three times a week, once a week, and less constantly. So bread, butter, alcohol, peas, chicken, eggs, bacon, all the things that you probably eat on a regular basis. And start with those foods you eat most of one by one and stop the food for five days, five days. Then on day six, you eat a normal portion of that food and only it, entirely on its own, as your first meal of the day. You take a sample of blood to measure your blood sugar immediately before eating that food and again about one hour later. So presumably if you're diabetic, you've got the finger pricking method. If not, get hold of one. If you've got cancer, get hold of one. And, and identify those foods that cause your blood sugar level to rise unduly high. And you may well discover certain symptoms occurring, because a lot of foods, if you avoid them and then challenge, can cause problems. That lady, as I explained, 
her symptoms cleared in the five days, but came back when she challenged with foods that were causing her problems. Now, from the anatomy of the pancreas, Dr. William Philpott said that, it is, that if the ability of your pancreas to produce insulin is compromised, as it is in diabetes, you can be sure its ability to produce its usual digestive enzymes and sodium bicarbonate is also compromised. We are taught in physiology that they're two separate parts. I'm sorry, I don't think so. They very much work hand in glove, just as the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla do exactly the same. So perhaps you ought to take digestive enzymes after meals, if you're diabetic, and a small dose of sodium bicarbonate about 20 to 30 minutes after the meal for a few weeks while your body is settling back to normal. You might also want to take some chromium and vitamin C in particular. There are many other nutrients which are important in this, but chromium is particularly important in the diabetic. You could perhaps do the five-day fast. You then, unfortunately, have to reintroduce the foods one by one. And I wrote the book, Conquering Cystitis, which I was asked to write about. But basically, it goes into the, the do's and don'ts of the five-day fast. And I don't think I've got any of them, any copies left anyway. But if anybody wants a copy, all they have to do is send me an email, and we'll happily send you a copy of the book. But please do not stop any drugs your doctor has prescribed for you without asking him how safe they are. To be perfectly fair, the vast majority of drugs you can just stop. Just stop. Even steroids you probably could do, um, but you need to be sure. And it might be sensible to talk to your doctor about this before you consider doing a five-day fast. My son's um, um, fiancé, recently went on a five-day fast. I thought she was very brave to do so. She lost 14 pounds, 14 pounds in five days. And when she challenged with tea, she developed a, a, a severe headache, arthritis in her hands and her feet, and she slept for 14 hours. That's what it did to her, and she's just a young chick. So, I've, what I've tried to do is I've tried to explain to you all you need to do. All you've got to do is identify your own foods that are causing your blood sugar levels to rise high. Yes, you've got to lose some weight, but the best way to lose weight is to avoid the foods that are causing your problem. All of that is on this website or on Amazon Kindle. Thank you for listening.